There we go. Okay, uh, so thanks all of you for taking the time uh, to attend this during your lunch hour. Um, and this came at a request from a few clinics, actually, which is great. So please always send in your requests for items you'd like on the education sessions. Uh, and so what we're going to do here is just a little overview of where we're at with some of our management of polycystic disease, a few new tools that we have, and a few things that are coming down the pipeline as well. So it's a good time to have a, a nice little overview. And so I'll take you through this over the course of the next hour. Um, as we go along, uh, as Alexis said, uh, since this isn't a, a webinar format, you can actually uh, pipe in and ask questions. You can either either raise your hand um, or uh, put something in the chat or even just to stop me along the way. And we can make this interactive as we go. Um, there's a few items that we'll uh, touch on here. Uh, to start with, I just want to welcome everybody and I want to acknowledge that uh, where I currently am in Surrey is in the shared and unceded territory of the Katsi, Semiamu, Kwantlen, and other Coast Salish peoples. And even though we're meeting virtually here, I think it's always good for us to reflect uh, the various parts of the province we're all uh, coming from. Um, I have an outline of a few items here uh, that we're going to talk about, although I see there's a spelling mistake, uh, prognostication, uh, I guess we're doing that in Italian today, um, a few different treatment strategies and some updates around things like genetic testing and where we see our, our network going uh, as, as time goes on. Um, so a few disclosures, the ones that I like to make, that's some financial relationships, including with the manufacturer of Tolvaptan. To mitigate that, I only speak about uh, published evidence for this, nothing else uh, regarding that drug, um, and a few other items there. And then the biggest disclosure I want to give is that really a thank you to all the people that have put a huge amount of work behind some of these materials I'm going to share. I see some of you on the line. Uh, we have our whole team of care uh, providers. We have our patient partners. We have Piety, Paul, uh, and Elise who have helped really shape this uh, over the years. So a huge thank you to them, yes. without which all of this wouldn't be possible. Okay, so let's let's launch into it. We're going to go over a bit of a crash course of some uh, update, just in, in case you know new people have come on and everything. Always good to to review and see how this relates to our care here in BC. So when we're talking about polycystic disease, I just always like to remind people that although we often think as genetic conditions as being quite rare, this is actually a very common one, a very common genetic condition. It is the most common inherited kidney disease, even amongst other just inherited genetic conditions. It's quite common. When you look at the numbers, somewhere between one to three per thousand people, or to extrapolate, it can mean even upwards of 10,000 people in BC living with polycystic disease. So that's just quite a common item. And specifically in our kidney world, it makes up a big proportion of, of what we see in our clinics and transplant units and dialysis units. Uh, polycystic disease is the fourth leading cause. And that's really only because they combine a bunch of them into a graph A called glomerulonephritis. If it was individual diseases, it would actually be the third. So it, it's quite a common thing that we encounter in our clinics. It makes up about 10% of our patient load in the kidney world. This is just a tracking of where our numbers are uh, in BC really since we've started doing this back in 2015. And there's various different places that we follow our polycystic disease patients. I'll come back to this a little bit later on. The green bar, the one at the top where it says RRT, that's renal replacement, meaning dialysis and transplant. So the combination of the two. And you can see those numbers are fairly steady have been growing as, as time goes on with population growth. But these other ones have, have grown quite nicely. The, pe the people who are um, in the kidney clinics and followed in our physician's office that we know about. And it doesn't mean that more and more people have uh, uh, happened over the last five years. Some of that's just going to be population growth. I think this actually speaks to the fact that we're identifying more people with polycystic disease and identifying them earlier, which is a great thing. And, and it's a really important part of our, our management because we really want to know about patients so we can implement treatment measures as, as early as possible. And it kind of comes back to, I want if I'm going to summarize all of what we're trying to do in one little picture and in one publication, for those of you that are interested, it would be this one. It would be this one that Fuad should be put out from his group at the Mayo uh, in terms of modern management of polycystic disease. And I, I think this is what our world of care should look like in a nutshell. To take you through the steps here that we, we talk about, it's basically when someone gets sent to one of us kidney specialists with bilateral kidney cysts, we first want to make sure that, yes, this is the correct diagnosis. This is ADPKD. So first we establish the diagnosis. 
Then the next step, which is really a cornerstone of modern polycystic disease management, is that we have to prognosticate their expected renal outcome. So try to figure out, are these people that fall into a more uh, aggressive renal progression, or are these people with a more reassuring uh, renal course? And then we select the treatments that we're going to implement. For those who are the rapid progressors, we'll talk about specific treatments. And that gets built on top of, I love this term of basic optimized ADPKD management, meaning for all comers, there's a suite of treatments that we should be thinking about, and then specific ones that we might uh, use with certain patients. For anyone interested, I really suggest going back and reading. This is an excellent review of, of how we should be caring for polycystic disease. As an aside for the care providers here, just right now in process is a KDGO guideline about PKD, which we should hopefully have sometime in the next year, and we'll, there might be some new insights there as well. Oops. So when we talk about, so we said, you know, steps, establish a diagnosis, which I won't go into the details too much. That's for us as the nephrologist. But then the next part really is about prognostication. And I, I think this is a good way to overview uh, polycystic disease is that and I love this picture, I actually show it to my patients too, that basically we see this play out where people tend to accumulate cysts. So people will get more cysts. The cysts they have in themselves will grow bigger. As that happens, the kidney actually grows in size, physically enlarges as this accumulates. And eventually what ends up happening is even though these cysts are just a minority of the nephrons, it's really, it starts to have impact on the rest of the healthy kidney tissue, both the blood flow, which is what this little picture is for. It has impacts on renal blood flow and the healthy renal parenchyma. This red line, which is what we all think about is GFR. And you can see that for many, many years in the disease it's preserved. That's because the remaining tissue is working harder and harder and harder, what we call hyperfiltrating and then eventually it falls off. And when it does so, it can do it quite quickly. So the, the big take home message that I'd like people to leave this one with is one, some changes in kidney size, which we'll talk about in a second, but also kidney function as represented by GFR is that change is relatively late in the disease. If we're just sitting around waiting for GFR to change, we've missed most of the disease course. Most of this happens before that ever falls. So our job when we're talking about predicting renal outcomes is to figure out before then what to expect uh, for people. And the reason that we really need to figure out what to expect for people is we want to give individualized prognostication. So the way we do this to really tell the individual in front of you what to expect is by looking at their, their kidney imaging. And again, I don't think this is, is uh, a new finding for a lot of people, but just to review it, the reason that, we, that we've, uh, this is so helpful, or one of the reasons it's so helpful is that this blue line is represented by kidney volume. You know, you can detect significant changes in this years before you would ever find a change in renal function. In some big cohorts, close to 10 years prior, you can start predicting what's going to happen to them based on their, their uh, kidney size, the actual rate at which their kidneys are growing. So we can get it way before we ever see that, that GFR drop. And the reason that we can actually use it for specific individualized prognostication is that we have this great tool that came out of the male classification that individ allows individual prognosis based on their kidney size. I, I really want to emphasize that at, this is the best tool we have at present to predict renal outcome in early stage PKD. And what I mean by that is once the GFR starts dropping, then we watch the GFR, right? That's telling you what's happening in your kidney function. But for those patients who are meeting early before that starts to occur, this is the real value of, of this tool. And we can see that with this classification, we can predict actually even to, out to quite a few years what to expect for their kidney function. So just a reminder of how this process works. Again, this is something us nephrologists will be doing is interpreting these results, but I, I think it's good for everybody to have a, a handle on how this works. This classification basically just takes the world of PKD and puts it on this graph. And uh, what I mean by that is on this y-axis, the vertical line, we have kidney volume. On the x-axis, we have kidneys or we have age, right? So we can say how long did a patient get to get to a certain volume. Those colored lines are really just these not arbitrary numbers, but just these set numbers of different percent growth extrapolated over time. So those are just straight lines, but it's a logarithmic scale. And then we plot people against that and see where do they fall. The biggest uh, thing to wrap your head around with this is we're not just talking about kidney size with this classification. 
since it's both size and time, we're really talking about the speed or velocity of growth. That's why I have these little pictures of fruit here on the side, that if, for example, we took a 20-year-old with an adjusted kidney volume in the 500 range, that would be about grapefruit uh, size kidneys on either side. That person would be in the highest risk category. They'd be right about here where my mouse is. If we took somebody with the exact same kidney size, but all of a sudden now they're 60 years old, they're actually going to be in one of the best categories because they got to, it took them 60 years to get to the same place that that other person got to in 20 years. That 60 year old would need to have kidneys the size of a head of cauliflower before we call it really big. So it's not just about how big your kidneys are, but how fast did, it, did you get there? And so doing that, we can put them into one of these five groups. And again, it's not just for us to kind of label something, but it's actually shown in, in some quite large studies that it correlates and can very well predict what's going to happen uh, to their kidney function as the years go on. The, the uh, higher of a grade you are in this male classification, the faster your expected renal course. So it correlates perfectly with their rate of, of renal decline. So this allows us to really better predict and accurately predict for the individual what do we expect for their kidney function as, as time goes on. So that's the nutshell of how it is that we interpret it. I also wanted to spend a few minutes just reminding people how it is that we get this information uh, in BC, because this is a common question that I sometimes get from around the province is, how do I pick which test to get? And how do I know uh, uh, that I'm getting the right type of scan to give me the right information? So I just want to remind people that we have a few tools available uh, on our BC Renal website to help you out with just this. In terms of the first question of figuring out what do I order and when, we have a, a specific document up there called Approach to Renal Imaging and PKD. And I, I won't go through it all in detail, but in a nutshell, it basically follows a few principles. One is that we want to maximize the information we already have available to us. So people who would have already had ultrasounds, or keep in mind, a lot of our patients with polycystic disease might end up in emergency with pain and they've had a CT scan done for a different reason. So you've already got images available to you somewhere. So it focuses on first, maximizing what you have available. And then if you have a requirement or you need to get new imaging, kind of walks you through, you know, how might, might you decide what to get? All with an emphasis of using tests that are going to be available to you locally. We want to make sure this works everywhere across the province, not just in, in the bigger centers. As the general rule, because the question people always say is, do I start with ultrasound or do I go right to cross-sectional imaging? And you'll see if you walk through that document, it says, start with ultrasound, because frankly, everyone with polycystic disease has an ultrasound at some point to begin with. If our ultrasound is telling us that they're already at an extreme of either really, really, really big kidneys or really small, almost normal sized kidneys, we can kind of stop there. We have the information we, we need. Whereas if either they're in that middle kind of gray area, which is a lot of patients, or if you need to do reassessments, then we're going to be looking at cross-sectional imaging, meaning either a CT or an MRI. But again, there's that, that uh, document there on the BC Renal website goes through that actually step-by-step step and kind of guides you through exactly which, which test to, to consider. The next most common question I get about imaging is how do we do the scans exactly correctly, meaning if you're going to order a scan, you want to make sure it's the right protocol. If we're talking about cross-sectional imaging, um, the way that we generally put this and what most people would say is that MRI is the preferred modality to CT just because you can do a non-enhanced MRI, so there's no exposure to, to anything as opposed to a CT scan, which does come with some radiation exposure uh, being a, a CT. So this is the approach that we get. We say, first try MRI. Now, in a lot of places in the province, it is actually more available, I think, than people think, especially if you have a talk with your local radiologist and make sure they're using what we call this limited MR sequence. And why I say that especially helps is because you don't need to do a full abdominal MRI to get a total kidney volume. And this protocol gets it down to about what they call seven minutes of magnet time, which is what they really care about in the MRI units, right? So in other words, they can get them through pretty quickly with this, and it makes them a little bit more likely to do it. You know, you might still be, I already know these often, you might still be waiting six months for it, but again, for a disease that plays out over decades, that's okay. So that's why I think this is still the, the first uh, option where available. 
If you don't have that available to you, then the next option that we have is this, this protocol that we uh, actually did a publication and uh, have studied, what we call our ultra low dose protocol, where basically they're able to get this CT scan down to an equivalent of about a three view film of the abdomen type of radiation, which is a really, really low dose. The only thing I would mention to people to please make sure you're doing is if you're going to be using CT uh, in your, your clinic, you really need to make sure you put on there that they use this protocol. Because if you don't mention anything, they might just put them in for the regular abdominal protocol, which is a fair amount higher than this. And I'm just always mindful, especially if we're talking about young patients where you can get this done potentially many times that we try to minimize that exposure. So that's how we get the images. And then the next question I get is how do they properly interpret it? And again, we have a tool for that online where we specifically have measurement instructions for people to go through. Detailed step-by-step -step radiolo uh, instructions for the radiologist of how to make these measurements. Very importantly, these are designed for any general radiologist. There is no specialized training available. Anybody can pick this up and run with it. So that's available, and, and you can share that with your radiology colleagues if, if they're having questions about it. We didn't. We came up with these, but again, it's something we validated in a study that we published just a, a last year, where we looked at the use of these um, instructions, and we saw a couple of things. Although there wasn't a dramatic difference in accuracy, part of that is because people, even without those instructions, have gotten better at it over the, the, the years. But we did find you know, some trends towards less extreme variability when people use the, these instructions, which is good. But even more reassuring, when we asked the radiologists themselves, including people who had very limited exposure to this before, a very, very large majority of them agreed that these instructions would make them more comfortable with providing an accurate result to you. So in other words, they felt better using this, that yes, I'm giving the nephrologist the information they need and I'm doing it accurately. So uh, this is just validation that these instructions we have are, are helpful to those radiologists. So please feel free to share the direct, those uh, instructions with your uh, radiologists if they have questions about this. They've also been disseminated through their provincial group, but sometimes, you know, as things go, that, that might not have gotten through to them, right? So feel free to point them to that BC Renal uh, resource. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of how we use imaging to prognosticate polycystic disease and how we can practically obtain these imaging for our patients. Now to come back to this kind of algorithm that we're talking about, now we can start going further down, right? Because we've now done step two where we've said, okay, we've broken our patients into our higher risk, our more rapid progressors, the people in the higher male categories that might need specific treatments, and then for everybody else, we want to make sure that we're layering on basic optimized management. So again, we have a set of resources, which hopefully people are familiar with uh, at this point, where we have a host of, of uh, tips in our best practice document, which is really meant to align with the KCC best practices, right? Think of it of how do we manage uh, PKD within our, our kidney clinics. So Taking through step by step, uh, at one point I always like to, to mention is that we're, we're quite lucky to be able to say this, right? In other provinces, they actually have GFR thresholds and cutoffs of who they can send to the kidney clinic and who they can't. Whereas in BC, actually, this, this isn't the case. And one of the things that's always specifically been a, a referral criteria for KCC in general is genetic diseases or things that you might expect to progress, right? So, so our patients fit in nicely to it. So we kind of say that really, this could be for all comers with PKD. Feel free to send everybody to, to the clinic. But very specifically, the group that are more rapidly progressing, have higher symptom burden, people you might be putting on disease-modifying treatment, at the very least, these are the core group that we want to see in our kidney clinics. But do think about it for, for all comers who might benefit from that multidisciplinary environment. So we put that guidance out there a few years ago, and actually we have seen quite a practice change across BC. So to, to orient you, these are kind of what we call uh, area maps, which basically these different colored bars represent different levels of kidney function on this graph. And the size of the bar tells you how many of those patients are there. So over the years, you can see what happened is that when we first started this, the vast majority, you know, 60%, of other PKD patients at kidney clinics had a GFR of 30 or below. 
Whereas as the years have gone on, it's almost completely flipped where now the majority are people with more higher uh, GFR levels. Kind of an indication that we're bringing people into the clinics earlier. They used to just be coming when it was time to start thinking about modalities and stuff like that. Whereas now they're coming in earlier to benefit from these services, which I think is great. And the same thing we see with the age where we've kind of shifted, where we're bringing in a, you know, a, a larger number of younger patients, again, telling us that we're bringing people in earlier, which is kind of our exact goal. Get them in and we can start implementing all of these uh, uh, management strategies. And again, I, I like to focus on this term that I just love of basic optimized management, which just aligns perfectly with everything that is that we want to do within the kidney clinic. Right? We want to identify people early, get them onto the best treatment strategies, give them detailed risk prognostication. And you can see, I won't go through every line here, but you can see a lot of what we call um, basic optimized management, things like blood pressure control, a lot of dietary considerations, controlling their um, uh, vascular risk. These are all things that are kind of bread and butter to us in the KCC, right? So it, it aligns very nicely, and we have a, a, a setup that I think we can really enhance this basic optimized patient, uh, control for our patients. To help support all of this, to go back to the BC Renal website, I feel like I'm just plugging it most of the time, but I just love, I really want to make sure people have you know, access and are using these tools that so many people put work into. Um, we have a whole suite of tools to, to help support this. So we have a learning needs questionnaire, meaning for when a patient first comes into kidney clinic to really go through with them and see what is it that we need to focus on for this specific patient. I like to put a plug because it's, it's always been identified that individual goal setting is something I think we can improve in the kidney clinic and this is a way we can do it. We have a clinic sheet, a sample clinic sheet that can be modified to your exact health authority that helps people go through and kind of do some symptom assessment as they would uh, uh, to help support that, uh, specifically for PKD patients. We have pre-made lab requisitions. And then for our staff, we have a whole suite of, of resources, things around blood pressure, which I'll talk about in a second here, specific choices around antihypertensives, use of lipid lowering therapy and dietary guidelines. So again, you know, one of the comments I sometimes hear is that, oh, in my clinic, we're, our staff are not as uh, uh, familiar with this. Maybe we don't have as much experience, which is okay. Actually, our whole goal is that we want to have this to support it so that we can start, you know, building up those, those tools. And the only way to build up that expertise in, in a team is just to frankly do it. And this will, you know, uh, give you a, a good, good starting point of how to take it and run with them. When to go over a couple of these items in the basic optimized management, there's blood pressure control. You can see that uh, this is uh, from the Canadian consensus guidelines. We put this in our best practice as well of a lower target blood pressure. This is based on something called the HALT PKD trial. So we've actually kind of seen this, you know, starting to be implemented, which I think is great. The one caveat I want to give people that I think sometimes people sometimes forget is this is not for all patients with PKD. This trial was specifically proven in younger patients with preserved kidney function. What the practical guidance most of us would use is try to do this. So especially in that group, you should definitely try it in younger patients with preserved kidney function. As their function starts to dip or as they might get older, if they're tolerating it, I think it's fair to carry on. But remember, if you're seeing someone who's not or someone who comes to you, uh, you know, de novo, with lower kidney function or as maybe later in life, there's not as clear evidence to push that hard. And, and we do know that in those groups of patients, you might start running into issues, right? So try it. If you have trouble, back off. The other big uh, group of items, you saw a lot of that list of basic optimized treatment had to do with dietary measures. And there are some, there are some pretty specific, unique considerations here compared to our general uh, a CKD population. So this is why actually with the help of, of some of our dietitians who are just excellent, we came up with these resources. So we have patient facing resources that help guide them through some of the dietary changes. Specifically, we have one for patients who are treated with tolvaptan and one for general considerations. And then the staff guide, which I think is just an excellent resource, really takes our, our, our staff through how do we do this assessment? There's some specific considerations. There's items in there, like, for example, we'll, we often use a 24-hour urine. 
to calculate their osmolal load, if, especially for those patients who are treated with vasopressin antagonism. And that's a pretty unique little tool that you know you might not otherwise be familiar with. So there's kind of step-by-step -step instructions in that staff guide as to how to do that. Okay, and then the last consideration. So we talked about those basic optimized management. Then there is disease modifying treatment. At present, we have the one disease modifying treatment of, of vasopressin antagonism or 12 aptam. In terms of how that works, I won't take you through this whole big scary document, but basically specific to the kidney, which is a nice thing. You have these receptors that are only found in the kidney called a V2R receptor. And it just happens to be that they're a stimulus for cyst growth. Uh, in, in polycystic disease. So we can specifically shut off that receptor without having impacts elsewhere in the body because it's only seen in the kidney. Now, people are aware of the, a lot of the side effects, which we'll go through in a second, which basically when you block vasopressin, you end up making it so that the person makes a lot of dilute urine. So they're making very, very watery urine and because of that, they're quite thirsty. And so I like to remember people that we have a name for that actually, it's called diabetes insipidus. So it's in some people, they have this condition, you know, uh, for a different reason. And basically, I, I like to, to use that example to say, you know, we're kind of trading one condition for another. We hope that it's a good trade, right, that by blocking this vasopressin and slowing down cyst growth, we're having a positive net benefit on people. But I, I really like to mention it this way, because this is more than just starting a blood pressure pill, for example, right? Like this is a medication that comes with predictable um, you know, side effects with it. And we do need to consider that because it's, it's, it, it's a big change for a lot of our patients. And I'll take you through that a little bit more detail in a second. But in terms of the evidence, there's a couple pivotal trials. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is one called Tempo 3-4. It was a landmark trial where they showed a decrease in the rate of uh, expansion of kidney volume and loss of GFR. And I like to specifically emphasize those words of decrease in the rate, meaning this is not a cure. In everybody, their kidneys still got bigger and their kidney function still went down. What this does is it slowed down the rate at which that happened. When we look at about GFR, of which this kind of correlates to, you can see there's a difference of about one mil per year of GFR, which doesn't sound like a lot. But uh, I also like to remind people, it's a similar GFR result that, for example, every diabetic in the world is on uh, RAS blockade. Right. So it's like anything else, compounding that difference over time is where you start to really see meaningful uh, benefits in people. So this was the first trial it was done in earlier patients. It was kind of replicated in a second trial where they looked at people who had actually already lost some kidney function. So people whose GFR was already lower and more advanced on the course. And we saw the similar type of effect. So we have it at a couple different states of the um, parts of the disease course where we saw this beneficial effect of slower loss of kidney function. Again, everybody still goes down. And I like to really specifically mention this because we sometimes in the kidney clinics, you know, we get calls or, or we sometimes we get worried because we're tracking their renal function over time and we see it's going down. Re remember, especially because we're really specifically using this in patients who are going to be more rapid progressors, the kidney function will go down over time. Um, the goal here is to slow that, to put the brakes on it as much as possible. The rule of thumb that people use, although it's never been clearly studied, the extrapolation is for about every four to five years that somebody's on treatment, they're going to get another year of good kidney function. And so you can see how this is a long-term treatment meant to kind of bend the curve over many, many years. So it comes with some downsides, though, and this is why I think we need to be, you know, frank and discuss it. As I said, we're basically inducing a different disease to treat the existing one, right? It's, it's a lot of what we call aquaretic symptoms, lots of urination and lots of thirst and lots of drinking. It's funny, you know, most of our kidney clinic patients, we actually have to kind of remind them, a lot of them, to, to drink enough water. Here, it's the opposite. The drinking isn't the hard part because people are thirsty. It's the urine, the frequent urination and going to the washroom all the time that, that can be hard for people to, to uh, work into their lives. When this was originally studied in those trials, there was quite a high rate of discontinuation for that reason. But in the real world, we find that actually the, the ability to stay with the medication is better actually than what we've seen in the studies. And this is not unique to us in BC. This is a finding that's been replicated across Canada. 
And I think the reason for that is we have now some great strategy to deal with these effects. One of them is that in the studies, they rapidly up titrated to the maximum dose. I still think that everybody, should, we should try to get them up to the maximally tolerated dose. That would be in keeping with the evidence for use of this medication. But what we do is we basically kind of do it judiciously, meaning rather than doing this every couple of weeks like I did in the trial, uh, for example, I personally will give them even months between dose increases, let them get used to it, and then ultimately you get them up. And I think that in and of itself goes a long way. One of the other big strategies we have is that minimizing and distributing the dietary solute is just by and away probably the most effective thing we can do. And the reason this works is that when you're on something like tolbaptan, which causes a fixed uh, dilute urine, the amount of urine you're going to make is directly propor proportional to the amount of solute you need to excrete. Less solute, less urine. And the two big ones that we can minimize are uh, salt and protein, specifically animal proteins. So we can both try to minimize that. And when we say distribute it, for example, we'll tell people have a heavier and protein heavy lunch and perhaps a lighter supper. Most people tend to have the other way around, but if you're having a big protein heavy supper, then a couple hours later when that stuff's all coming through, in other words, when you're starting to get ready for bed, you're going to have that big uh, uh, load that you need to get rid of. Whereas again, people don't mind as much having to urinate more frequently in the earlier part of the day. It's the nighttime urination that really, you know, getting up all night that tends us to really uh, weigh on people. So shifting that early in the day is another very, very effective strategy. And then lastly, it's definitely a sick day medication. And frankly, I tell people they can have a cheat day every now and again. The nice thing about it is very short acting. They stop the medication. That's it. They stop urinating and, uh, and then they can pick it up again later on. And that goes a long way to, to adherence. Lastly, monitoring, I think everybody's aware of this because in the trial, there was a signal towards, there was actually three individuals who had a bad liver outcome, completely unexpected, idiosyncratic reaction, meaning it's not related to any pre-existing disease or anything like that. Think of it almost like an allergy, just out of the blue, you can't predict what's going to happen to. Because of this, there's mandatory monitoring for the first year and a half once, uh, once a month. We're now, oh, I should say nearing 2,000. This is an old slide. I need to update it. We're nearing, nearing 3,000 people now in Canada who've been treated with this medication. And with this, there is zero highs law cases, meaning zero bad liver outcomes. Because what happens is if you see the liver enzymes abnormal, stop the medication. There's some guidance there about rechallenging. I won't get into the details there, but in terms of uh, any actual significant liver damage, stop the medication, that's it. No, uh, no permanent damage. What this entity means is if someone were to be left unchecked and stay on the medication, then it can cause permanent damage. But in this setting of frequent monitoring and clear guidance of when to stop, there have been zero uh, bad liver outcomes with this. So it's a very reassuring thing. So I often tell patients, to me, this is more of a nuisance than it is a safety item. Uh, you just need to keep up with the, the monitoring. Okay, and then the last thing that I want to mention about uh, uh, tolvaptin here is just how to obtain it. Most of you would be aware that we're about two years now into this process where we have an application process, and that's really to make sure that we're getting the right people for it, right? I sometimes hear comments of, well, that, you know, why shouldn't we just be using it in everybody? And, um, you know, the explanation there is, you have to remember, there's a group of PKD patients who will never meet a renal outcome. They will never reach end stage. They'll go about their way, they'll live their lives, and even though their kidney function might trickle down, they'll get to 80 or 85, and maybe they'll pass away from something else and their kidneys are still working. So the last thing you want to do is take somebody like that, put them on a medication that has pretty significant side effects for decades, and they would have been fine without it, right? So this is why we want to carefully select, because we want to make sure we're really giving to the people who would benefit and not exposing toxicity to the patients who actually would have been fine without it. So we have very clear set criteria in the way this process works. You fill out the form. We have pharmacists who adjudicate this similar to rituximab and, and then come back and, and, uh, and, and tell you uh, if, if you've been approved. And so we have it in three groups. Uh, again, just to go uh, quickly through this, group A is what I call the slam dunk group, right? Young patients, earlier in disease course with massive kidneys, slam dunk. These are definitely people who would stand to derive benefit and, uh, and should be on the treatment. The next group that we have, we've set kind of a higher bar for the older patients, which again, questions come up. Originally, we set this people with 
asking to this ageist or something like this. This is not the case. It's more, it's just kind of when you think through it, it's hard to be a rapidly progressing patient at an older age and still have intact kidney function. In other words, if you were really that rapidly progressing, you would have already had a problem by the time you got to this age. So this is meant to catch that group who might just be on the cusp of starting to run into to trouble, but there is a slightly higher bar, which is why we want to see that they have all of these items. Their kidney function is starting to decline because if you've made it to 55 with normal kidney function, you're not a rapid progressor. So your kidney function is starting to decline and you have quite big kidneys and we're seeing ongoing progression. So a bit of a higher bar to clear, again, to make sure we've got people who are actually going to benefit from this. And then just to make, because no tick boxes can't capture everything, uh, the group C, I always call it the kind of make your case group, meaning if they fall just outside that box for whatever reason, but you still think that someone is going to benefit, we do have a way of, 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 of working that in. Okay, so you fill out this application form, it kind of guides you through the process, and then it goes over to be adjudicated. And oh, I have some stats, which should have been on the next slide, but uh, it's one after. Um, to support this, this process, uh, we have all kinds of information. We have frequently asked questions as what kind of guidance documents for patients, for prescribers. We have pharmacy information sheets, all of these great handouts that we can use to support uh, the use of it. At, in terms of where we're at with this, this, uh, this is from our, our uh, annual report, which we're due to do actually coming up this year again. But when we did this last year, um, you know, this is great. We have actually just a whole host of information on how we're using Tolvaptin in BC. And frankly, we can tell you more about this than anywhere else in the country in terms of what our usage is actually looking like. We can see people who are treated. You can see that, you know, we can look at how old people are, where they're at when they're starting, what their kidney volumes like. So we can really accurately describe what these patients are. You can see most of the applications, most of the people who are on treatment uh, at present are in that slam dunk group, which is which is great. I think it's good that those people are benefiting. We'll see as if that shifts as people are picking up more of that middle group as time goes on. And then we have all of this information about, uh, just to summarize, a kind of excellent adherence to safety monitoring here in BC. And again, I think, frankly, we can tell you more about this than even Health Canada can, which I think is just a, a testament to the robust monitoring system we've, we've built up here. And we see that you know the rate of discontinuations and all, all of this information, which we'll be able to track for, for years to come. So very, very helpful because we want to make sure if we're using this medication and you know BC Renal's funding it, that we're using it both appropriately and safely. And so this is good evidence that, that we are doing just that. Okay. So lastly, I know I'm going through a whirlwind just covering a whole, a whole lot of stuff here, but this is meant to be a one-hour overview of all of care here. Um, just a few other items that we talk about. Um, there's some pain uh, uh, items that come up, right? These kind of urologic complications, we call them, which I like to just re really remind people are more frequent than I think we often recognize. Uh, you can see that that statistic there that by age 30, over 50% of people have had at least one of these, right? So it's, it's and they become more and more common as the disease and time goes on. So a, a pretty uh, a common occurrence. We have I think I have that on the next couple of slides. We have some guidance to talk to, to support people through pain management of PKD uh, as well. I actually just want to check that I've got it there. Oh yeah, I do. Okay. Um, this question comes up a lot. And again, I want to point to the guidance we have available in terms of screening at risk family members. Which test should we do and when and in whom? This is a super common question that comes up, uh, you know, especially individuals will come to you and they'll say, well, that's me, that's fine, uh, all well and good, but I'm more worried about my kids. When do I have to test them and, and how do I go about doing that? And you can see that we have a few uh, uh, items there around um, exactly when to do this, the long and short uh, of it being that, you know, in, in young children, we generally say in early age, pre-symptomatic testing, we don't go for that. We talk about a few guidance around monitoring for symptoms and blood pressure in young children, then ultimately testing them as they get a bit older. Excuse me. And then there's a specific resource uh, around family planning and pregnancy as well, which, uh, you know, I've had a few patients go through this now that they find this guidance very, very helpful, quite comprehensive stuff. So please do uh, check that out online. And then the last item that um, uh, to mention is screening for aneurysms. Again, in our best practice, we have some documents around this. I think we're going to see this be updated on the KDGO guidelines too as they come out. Um, 
it's, you know, it's unclear and it's always been kind of wishy-washy statements I find in, in previous guidance where they say, well, and those are the family history of aneurysm because it does track in families. Um, you know, those people definitely need to be screened 100%. But without, there was always weird guidance like um, if patients are in a high risk occupation, you should screen them, but not if they're not, right? As in like, you know, if a bus driver has an aneurysm rupture and then a lot of people get injured, obviously that's a bad thing. But it kind of says that to the individual person that it doesn't matter if that happens to them, which I've always found kind of unusual. Um, and there's this thing around patient anxiety. I've never understood that where you say to someone, there's a possibility you might have an aneurysm that can rupture in your brain. Does that worry you? Like, how do you ask somebody if they're anxious about that? Of course, of course, any rational person would say they're worried about it. You know, why the whole the whole reason why the controversy around this was it's unclear what to do because a lot of uh, what you pick up is small incidental aneurysms that will never be a problem. So what they were trying to gauge in the past, especially when it had to be high dose CTs was weigh the risk of that and unnecessary intervention versus the screening. Whereas now, especially if you're doing MRs, which don't need to be enhanced at all, um, you know, there's no downside to doing that screening. And the biggest thing is just to know what to do with it because you get a lot of these small ones that you never need to do anything for, but monitor. And, and our guidance that we put in the best practices, you know, I think you should consider this in all, in all of your patients. Personally, I offer it to absolutely every PKD patient I have. And then whenever you're unsure what to do, getting neuro, neurosurgical uh, input is very, very helpful. And often they'll just look at the scan and tell you, oh yeah, don't worry about this, just do a repeat, uh, you know, or, or they need to actually do something about it. And then the last item, I saved this for last actually because I really wanted to highlight it. It's the same slide, just talking about that the frequent incidence of these urologic complications and pain. And just to segue into, this is one of the resources that actually I'm, I'm proudest of that we developed in concert with the PKD Foundation of Canada. We had many um, patient partners on our working groups where we did this, where we've actually come up with some resources around chronic pain management in, in PKD. And uh, you know, I've talked to a few people now who've been using this and they find it super helpful. It's one of these things that actually there just wasn't a lot out there. And so having some strategies, a lot of them, you'll see if you go through this document, a lot of them are kind of basic chronic pain management strategies, but specifically tailored to, to PKD. And people have found this very, very helpful. So I can't say enough, you know, what, what a great resource this is. And we're lucky to have some great input to, to be able to develop this. So please do check that one out. Okay, and then the last item, which is kind of quite new that I wanna bring up, and some of you might've seen we did a province-wide rounds about this um, sometime towards the end of last year, I forget exactly when, was around having a standardized process to genetic testing and actually trying to enhance availability of gen genetic testing for PKD. Again, if you go to our BC Renal website, you'll see a whole host of resources specifically about that. Really the two resources are step-by-step uh, you know, thinking about uh, how and when to order genetic testing, and then the actual pre um, kind of pre-populated requisitions you can send off for. So what we wanted to do when we went about this process was really say, you know, our goal is to standardize and improve the access to genetic testing. And part of that is a couple of things. So one, if there are more straightforward situations where you want to order this directly as a nephrologist, we want people to be able to do that. We still, you know, in the past, what a lot of people had done was just refer them to medical genetics. We still want to be able to access that expertise that those teams have. So we want to be able to accomplish both things. Think about the appropriate situation and who should be involved in the testing is what this resource takes us through. To start with, what we really want to think of is that genetic testing is not for everyone with PKD, at least at the current state and time. And in fact, if anything, it's for a minority of patients. It's really when that results of that test are going to change management. And, and I give a couple examples here. Like, for example, if you can't specifically make the diagnosis just based on imaging or family history, either incomplete family history, an atypical imaging presentation, or some combination thereof, you know, where you're not perfectly sure this result would change management, this is really the group to think about it in. So, to kind of walk through this, we've kind of came up with a few different situations. The one situation um, where we think that it's probably going to be nephrologists ordering this, so long as they're comfortable, is where you think that this probably is PKD, 
But again, there's something that's just not quite typical uh, about it. And so you want to confirm, uh, confirm this. And so in this setting, we have this process, uh, and I won't go through it step by step, but we have this process and pre-filled uh, documents where you can set up the genetic testing. Now, I want to contrast that to things like this second situation, where actually you're not sure if this is PKD or not. Right. So the first one is I'm pretty sure, but maybe, you know, they're very early. They've got no, I'll give you an example. They've got no family history. They're earlier in their disease course. So they've only got still, you know, eight or nine cysts or something like that. But they're really you're starting to think about family planning or starting, you know, for some reason, they, we really need to have a definitive diagnosis. Contrast this to where you look at the image and say, you know, this does not look like PKD to me. This looks like something else is going on. The reason that we want the medical genetics teams involved in that one, that's where I say the nephrologist isn't doing this directly, we get the medical genetics teams involved, is because they might think about broader genetic panels, right? They might think about other conditions. Sometimes they'll even do what we call whole exome sequencing, right? Which is something we would not be doing as nephrologists. So basically, if you think something else different is going on, it's best to get that, that involvement. Another big example of where we want to involve the medical genetics team is around family planning. Now, I have a star there because at currently in BC, if you're trying to get genetic testing just for family planning reasons, that's not being covered. So it can still be tricky to get the exact, exact genetic testing done. But in that situation, I think most of the value actually comes from the fact that they'll meet with the genetics counselors at that clinic, and they'll be able to really talk them through what are the various options here. And that's just a huge uh, service. So the, the whole reason we're referring to medical genetics is not just to get the test done. It's actually that expertise is very, very beneficial for people who really weigh in their options in that regard. So again, there was a whole, if you're interested, we did a whole hour talk about what this process is going to look like. It's on the BC Renal website. Uh, but I just want to remind people that this is available. And if you do decide that it's a situation to do this yourself as a nephrologist, uh, there's tools on the Renal Agency website to walk you through that. And then the last item, you know, just to talk about kind of the future of where it's going, right? We've spent the last really, you know, four or five years creating a lot of resources to support PKD management. And uh, for those of you who are on our committee, you see that we're, we're saying, well, some of that stuff is winding down and we want to just this to be an ongoing part of what we do in KCC. And I think it is as important. It's always going to be, a, you know, a, something, a large group of patients that will want to give specialized care to. I think the next step, though, as we're kind of more now on maintenance mode is, and this is what we've heard from, from you, you all as well, is to set up a coordinated group of clinicians across the province where we can kind of share experience. As updates come up, we can talk about them and discuss that. And so that's what we're transitioning into now. And we have just in a few weeks, we have this upcoming uh, case round. So I want to give a plug there both for people to attend and if you have cases that you want to bring forward, where basically we'll say, you know, this will almost be like a working group where people can bring forward either challenging cases, parts of management that they might be struggling with. And as a provincial community, we can all discuss and learn from each other rather than feeling like we have to do this uh, on our own. And I think this is going to be a big part of our future of our network is kind of an integrated group of clinicians across the province sharing experience in PKD management. And I just always love ending with, with these slides. If this is, you know, putting this all together, I think this is really how we're getting somewhere new in PKD management, right? We've gone from a world where even, you know, when I first was doing my training in this, a lot of PKD management was check the blood pressure, check the GFR, and then when they get ready for transplant or, or dialysis, you know, get them set up for that. Whereas now I think we have a whole suite of resources where we can individualize care offer people, regardless of whether they're a rapidly progressing patient or not, offer them, offer them best optimized PKD management, and it really suits itself to, to being done in a multidisciplinary uh, kidney clinic environment like we have set up. So with that, I just want to see if there's any comments or, or questions there. That was kind of the whirlwind tour of all of PKD management in 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, I thank you guys for attending. And if anybody has any questions, please either unmute yourself, put them in the chat, however you like.
this is the part of the webinar where nobody's asking questions. So it either means I went through it well or I went through so quickly uh, that nobody got a chance to even get an ed, a word in edgewise. Um, oh, okay. So there's a, a question on the chat here uh, from Hillary. She's asking, um, how long does it take people to get used to the aquaretic uh, side effects of tolvapten? Okay, so it's a good question. Now, we know there's actually some physiologic adaptation that uh, that happens when people start taking the medication. Even after a week or two, that, that, that happens. Kind of an experience, the first month is the roughest, honestly. And, you know, um, uh, that's what most of my patients have said, is that because it's both that physiologic adaptation, but I think the majority is actually a lifestyle modification, right? Just people actually start thinking about where are the washrooms, planning out their day and stuff like that and making it workable for them, how it integrates into their work day, you know? So uh, probably the first month is, is, is the hardest, what most people say. Again, we have, you know, 85 plus percent retention rate past that. So people are able to get through it. Just that's the real uh, time where people find they add up. And that's why I, I frankly, I don't even touch the dose usually for four, three or four months or something like that. Like it's, it's just not uh, um, uh, worth it while they're still in an adaptation phase. One of the things we sometimes do, you know, uh, just to kind of go even to, to the next level is we talked about um, the solute load being a big determinant of the symptoms, uh, the aquaretic symptoms. And so if we have time before someone starts, in, in my clinic, sometimes we'll even do that 24-hour collection before they start, which is great because if you can optimize some of those solute factors before they go into it, sometimes that goes a long way too. So it doesn't just, you know, hit people like a ton of bricks if they have, you know, if they're still taking four grams of salt a day and then start the medication, uh, you know, that could be pretty wicked. So um, yeah, sometimes even optimizing that even before they start can be helpful. Uh, and yeah. I, oh, thanks. Thanks, Hillary. Okay. And yeah, there's a question will be available. Sure. Absolutely. And this was, oops, I was scrolling up and on the chat and I scrolled my thing. Um, uh, and this recording will be on the BC Arena website as well. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll the chat and I end up scrolling my presentation. Um, oh, it's, okay. So Chris has put in an excellent question about, there's been some comments about ketogenic diets and PKD. Okay. So this is almost a, a can of worms. So there's some trials ongoing and I really recommend, you know, and that's really what I want to see. Part of this is there's some animal model stuff. Actually, some of the animal models is uh, frankly, essentially a starvation diet. And it turns out that, you know, the cysts don't grow as much, but it also turns out you can't put a human being on a starvation diet with, without having running into some ethical considerations. So then the next step was a ketogenic diet. And there's both ketogenic diets and ketone supplementation, both of which are being looked at. And it, so there's a trial on this. It also happens there's a commercial company out there now that's selling essentially uh, ketone and some other components like citrate uh, supplements to try to slow this down. It's there's some trials going on, you know, to be honest, going to market with something before there's big trials is a bit unfortunate because we'd like to actually learn the benefit of this. So if, for example, in Ontario, they're, they're recruiting for trials. They haven't yet expanded that to BC, but I'd love to be included if they do that. It's all to say that I think that the, the, the um, jury is still out. There is some promising evidence, but we do need larger trials. The one comment I like to always make to my patients if they're considering this, I think it's a reasonable thing to consider. But the one comment I always like to make to people, and, and you know, dietitians on the group will probably know this, a lot of what people think of as a ketogenic diet, or what you might see online as a ketogenic diet, is not actually a ketogenic diet. It's a high-protein diet, right? Like a true ketogenic diet would essentially be to substitute your carbs for fat and still be able to maintain a normal amount of protein. Because remember, we're actually suggesting to our patients we don't want them to have higher-protein diets, Right. So sometimes the, I say kind of the lazy or the cheater version is to say it's basically what's a high protein diet. And that's not exactly the same thing. Sticking to a true ketogenic diet is actually very, very difficult. Now, my patients, if some of them want to do that, I actually think that's reasonable, you know, as long as you're actually doing that true form of ketogenic diet. But yeah, the, the short answer is the jury's still out. And especially, oh, perfect. Thanks. I'm glad, uh, yeah, I'm glad to agree. Sounds like I'm preaching the choir. And then, yeah, we'll really need to see that, that uh, you know, data, right? That's what I, I think we really want to see. Yeah. Oh, and Piety put in a question about keto citra. That's exactly the, one of the ones I'm talking about, uh, Piety, where it's um, there, you know, it's a combination of a ketone supplement to try to, you know, get some of that benefit without the very, very difficult task of having a ketogenic diet. 
uh, and citrate, which is the other component. Of, again, there's some conflicting evidence there. At this point, I'd say it's still a bit early. I think there's no harm in it if people want to try that, but we're waiting for big studies that'll tell us for sure, you know, is there going to be benefit or not? We hope to have that within the next, you know, year or two. Yeah, so it's hard for me to say that, yes, this is definitely proven. Uh, so my, my approach is always, if people want to try that, I think that's fine, so long as they're doing it in the right way, in a safe way. Um, great. If no other questions, I just want to give that one last plug. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be having those case rounds. Again, if anybody, I'm going to send another email reminder out. Uh, if anybody has cases they want to bring forward, that they want to discuss with the group, you know, some specific questions like this, love to, to have these conversations. Uh, or if you just want to attend as a fly on the wall to hear the conversation, please do. Otherwise, yeah, please check out all those resources that are up online, you know, a whole host of things there. Uh, and feel free to, uh, this presentation should be up there before long on the website as well. And you can take a, a review through it as, uh, again if needed. Otherwise, just thanks everyone for devoting an hour of your time here to, to get that whirlwind tour of, of PKD management.